So I thought I would use some photographs to tell you about how I found my purpose in life. Now, when I talk about purpose, I'm talking about the reason why you're on planet Earth. When we were born, two things were given to us, okay? One is your purpose, and one is a compass. The compass was given to you in order to help you navigate how to achieve your purpose. It is everybody's duty to find out what your purpose in life is. And that's what makes us um, wake up every morning and do the things that we love. So the first thing I'm going to show you, if I get this right, is that photo. That is me in the middle there. <laughs> my mother had to feed me. You can see my hands in my mouth in order for me to sit for this portrait. It was taken, <laughs> it was taken in Sabungeri Kano in Nigeria. Um, since I don't know my left from my right, so let's face that way. My children taught me that. That is Remy over there. I'm going to talk about Remy. Um, I'm not going to talk about myself. And that is Larry. Remy um, is a gentle soul. I think from a very young age, Remy sort of knew what she was meant to do on planet Earth. I will tell you what happened to Remy. It's a bit of a tragic story. But what gives me peace is that the short life that Remy lived on planet Earth, she did everything she was meant to do. Now, life is not about how long you live. It is about the impact that you have while you're here, the impact you have on people. So, Remy, um, Remy has always been, like at the age of, we all went to boarding school, and when Remy got to boarding school, she decided that she was going to be a born again Christian. And she wasn't one of those judgmental, Bible bashing Christian. She was gentle. When I had, boy, when I had boyfriend issues, it was Remy I turned to. She would speak to me with love, gentleness, and in a non-judgmental way. And Remy had always been like, she's always lived in a Christian way. One day, I was sitting in Costco, waiting for Costco to open. And 10 minutes to 9 o'clock when Costco opened, I thought, OK, let me look at my Facebook in the car, waiting. And the first message that I got that popped on, on my screen was, may her soul rest in peace. Remy died. I did not even know. But you know busy bodies, you know the way they start to post things without even checking whether the family members have that message or not. So what happened to Remy was, on a Friday night, she went to church for choir practice. Remy loved to sing. Went to church on a Friday with her husband. A friend was meant to drop something off for her. The friend called. The friend just had a baby, a first-time mom. And Remy stepped outside, spoke to this friend. On her way back into the church to continue what she was doing, the, the child, the baby, made a sound in the car, and the friend ran into Remy, and Remy died instantly. That is a tragic way to die. Yes, I get that. But Remy died in the place she loved, doing what she loves. That gives me peace. The reason why I'm telling you this is not to shock you. Actually, it's to shock you. <laughs> because I want you to know that every single minute of your life matters. You have to look for a purpose. 
you have to find the reason why, you, or why you're here. It's quite important. That gives me peace. The next photo I'm going to show you, those are my daughters, Eniola. That's Eniola there. She is, I call her favorite daughter number one. <laughs> that is favorite daughter number two. She is the one killing me because she's like me. We have the same personality. Now, when Eniola, before Eniola was born, I had an amazing job. I was a credit uh, risk analyst for um, a pharmaceutical company. I thought life was good. I love expensive handbags. <laughs> so I, that, that was what I lived for, my expensive handbags and, you know, my job. Nothing else defined me. Then these kids came. I met the most amazing man, John Telford. These kids came and they changed everything. When they came, I realized that I couldn't, I can't be who I'm meant to be, a mum, without loving myself. In order for me to love these kids unconditionally, guess what I had to do? I had to work on myself. Who am I? Why am I here? How would I bring up these kids to be great citizens of the world? And the journey started. One day, I was sitting down, daytime TV, because that's what stay at home, uh, at home moms do, isn't it? And Yola was in a basket. Oprah came on TV. And she started talking about this thing called purpose. And I thought, what is she talking about? I didn't get it. Two days later, somebody else, she brought somebody else on TV um, as a guest. And this woman started saying something like, in order for you to find your purpose, you've got to love yourself. You should be able to look in the mirror and tell yourself, I love you. I thought that was a bit odd. <laughs> You know, because we've been told that we did not say I love you to ourselves. But the next morning, guess what I did? I knew I had a hole in my life. The next morning, I woke up 4 a.m., went to the downstairs bathroom in my house. There's a big mirror there, stripped down, naked. I looked in the mirror and I saw an image there that I'd never, ever seen in my life. I saw my image. It was scary because this time I was not looking at, am I beautiful, am I not? What am I wearing? I was there to see Yvonne. I stood there, I looked in the mirror, I ran out. I couldn't bring myself to say, I love you. So how can I love this child? If I cannot love myself and say that to myself, I just couldn't do it. Every single day, guess what I did, 4 a.m. I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing because that was a big cuckoo. <laughs> Every single day, I turned up 4 a.m. in front of that mirror. Almost a year went by. One day, I said it. I said, Yvonne, I love you. That was a breakthrough for me. If you've never tried it before, Please try it. You see a different side. I saw the eyes I'd never seen before, my eyes. And that gave birth to me starting what I do. I'm a fashion designer. I'm not a trained fashion designer because from the age of four, I knew I wanted to dress women in fabulous clothes. That is my purpose. So that women can take up their space. They can embrace who they are so that they do not shrink themselves. That is my purpose in life. And that's what I do. And these women, I mean, these girls, are the people that help me. So when that journey started, my children, I was at home, I've got how many more minutes? Okay. <laughs> so that journey started of me trying to discover who I am. Who, who is Yvonne? I could say I love you to me now, but something was still 
missing. So, I decided that when my daughter, she was five, the first daughter started school, favorite daughter number one started school, and favorite daughter number two, I was going to put her in nursery. I was speaking to a mom. I knew I was going to be lost, and I didn't want to spend all my day cleaning. So I thought, what am I supposed to do? So I decided I was going to do GCSEs, even though I don't need it, because I grew up in Nigeria, and I wanted to understand what my children would face in England with regards to their education. So I was speaking to a mom who said, why don't you start writing a blog? So I called my husband at work, and I said, John, do you know this thing called blog? He was like, yes, I do. I said, when you come home tonight, for you to have your dinner, you have to set up a blog for me. He was like, okay, what press? Again, because I've formed the habit of waking up at 4 a.m. every morning, 4 a.m. every morning, I started writing. I didn't know who I was writing for at that particular time. You know that thing I said to you about compass? That is me staying in my lane. The universe was telling me, Yvonne, in order for you to start dressing women, we need you to, you know, we need you to be well in yourself. So now your therapy is going to start by you writing. At that particular time, I did not. The reason why I refused to show my face in this portrait that my husband took was because I felt shame with my stories of my life. There was shame. But as I wrote, I started building a community of women who understood my story and they got it. And one thing I learned from that story is that we all want the same thing. We all want to be seen. We all want to be loved. And our stories are the same. Some come in little packages. Some come in Harrods packages. But if you open it, it's still the same thing. So that sort of made me realize that the women who understood my story is because they felt the same pain that I did. So I started this blog, I started writing, and I went for a blogging event where they said, oh, you know, you've done this writing thing, now you need to move to the next level. Somebody was advising me, you've got two beautiful daughters, now why not be a mommy blogger? That didn't last a long time, you know, because my daughters were great. I didn't have a lot. And I noticed I started writing about food. I shouldn't have listened to that person because that person took me off my lane. She did. So sometimes when experts are advising you, you need to listen to your compass. So I did a disco locally, a mother-daughter disco, because I felt I don't have like a a memory of my mother and I having fun. So I thought locally I was going to organize a disco. Mother, daughter, come on a Saturday to a school hall and let's boogie. <laughs> and some people got really angry about that. They thought, who are you to organize a mother, daughter disco? On a Saturday night, I was sitting at home and a friend called me and she said, <laughs> Look on Facebook, some local women that I know are slagging you off. I had two choices, to get angry and not to do my disco or to start replying to them. And I thought, what decision should I make about this? Can you imagine you sort of buying a house, painting it because I'd worked so hard? I will show you the photo of me, actually, before I talk about what happened. That is me actually hustling to get women to sign up for the disco. I wore this on a school run. My daughter took that photo <laughs> because I wanted people to know about disco. So I, I wore that and my daughter, and I would stand in front of the gates at different schools locally telling them about this disco. So I had worked so hard to get this disco off the ground. And women were on Facebook slagging me off. And I thought to myself, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to get angry? What am I supposed to do? And I made one decision, and that decision saved me. 
And these women were slagging me off. I was deleting what they were saying because I didn't want other people to see it because it would affect the cells. But guess what I did? I was blessing them. Instead of getting angry, I was saying, I bless you. I bless you. And they were saying they're rubbish, but I was deleting it. That was what I did. That was a decision I made because I, I could not feel, I did not want to feel any anger because when you feel anger, guess what? You stop blessings from coming to you. So that was a decision I made and I'm glad I did that. So again, these are, before I discovered what I was going to do, or what I wanted to do in order for me to get to Kemi Telford, which is the name of my company, my brand at the moment. I did so many different things. I kept on listening to the universe saying, go this way, go that way, go this way, go that way. In order for you to get to the destination, you know, we have to take you in different, you're still on the same lane, but what I was doing at this particular time that I did not know I was doing was building a community of people who still support me even now? Some of them feel, I mean, some of them have left my community because we evolve. And as you evolve, some people will be behind, some people will be in front of you. So some of them, but majority of the women still support me. So for me, I feel like the universe I've always, as long as I use my compass, the universe is always there to you know, support me. So that's one of the events that I did locally. So I, when I did the mother-daughter disco, somebody told me that, do you know that companies can actually sponsor you? Just write to them. The only people, I wrote to so many companies to sponsor me, to sponsor the disco. I didn't have a big following on Instagram or Facebook. I was rejected, obviously. <coughs> You know, but the only company that supported me at that time was Rude Health. They sent me um, <laughs> cereal bars and they sent me their drinks in pouches. But I didn't like the way that made me feel, begging people. In the Nigerian culture, we have something called a calabash. And you see beggars sitting on the floor with their calabash in front of them begging. I didn't like how that made me feel. And I thought, I want to make my own money. What can I do to make my own money? I don't want to go begging brands to give me money. So I thought I will put 50, am I saying I thought a lot? <laughs> <laughs> so I invested 50 pounds into buying these tote bags. What I did not do, and please, if you do this, stop it. What I did not do was to write to somebody, then it was Selfish Mother, who sold tote bags on the internet. I did not write to her. I actually sat down on a Saturday, my husband was looking after the kids, and I researched tote bags, <coughs> and that helps me, because now I understand my business. I don't do tote bags anymore, because I've, you know, we evolve, but this was the tote bag that I created, I bought, I think, 20 of them. I got the guy that um, <coughs> prints my children's um, uniform, and I got him, I spoke to him, Graham, and I said, can you help me with this? And he said, yes. And since then, I've reinvested in my business. From 50 pounds now, you know, the company is doing not so bad. We are stocked in John Lewis, I've done a collaboration with Tate Gallery, and we have so many other things. And it's self-funded, you know, from that Nigerian girl who came to England with her father's prayers and 250 pounds. Slippers in the winter, 26 November 1996, and an Okrika coat. If you don't know what Okrika is, Okrika is where you go to in Sabogori Market to go and buy used clothes that the West has shipped to Nigeria, bought a coat. Nobody told me that it was going to be cold in England in November, so I wore flip-flops. And when I stepped out, it was freezing, my feet were frozen. And um, let me see if I have more pictures. So you can see I tried so many things. This was me thinking, how many totes can women buy? Let me move into necklaces. I started selling necklaces. Then for my fashion brand, 
what I do now. People on, in, on the Instagram, I don't know whether you get this a lot, where you'll be wearing something fabulous and they'll say to you, without please, they will say, where did you get that from? Yeah. Do you see that a lot? Yeah. Where did you get that from? This used to annoy me. I used to wear skirts like this and I'll carry a tote bag. This, I was wearing Selfish Mother's um, t-shirt because she had sent some to me and I was wearing that skirt. And I kept on going, where is that from? One day I was in the shower, it used to annoy me. I was selling something, maybe my tote bag, and they would say, they're not buying the tote bag, they're saying, where is your skirt from? I thought there must be something in this. Why don't you invest some money? I was in the shower and I thought, okay, so what we're going to do is, we're going to create skirts. I understand wax because that's what I saw women in Nigeria wearing. I started looking for a manufacturer to help me. And I ran into a lady who was just starting a business. And she was ready to work with me. And I still work with her. She creates the majority of what I, 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 I sell. So that is that. But to round this up, <laughs> the timer that has gone off. <laughs> I went to an event. I was invited. This is where. I decided that I was not going to my business, I'm not going to be small-minded about my business because something happened. So Christmas, I, um, I went to, you know, one of those stalls where, you know, at Christmas and you go to school halls and you see people selling their things. I went there. So I live in Surrey and I decided that this particular stall was in East London. I call that the end of the earth from where I live. Got on the train, my husband had taken the day off, got on the train with a big suitcase and um, got there, stood there. Nobody bought anything except a woman who came to me. I'd spent like 150 pounds on the stall. I had um, spent money on my transport and the only thing I sold was seven pounds 50. And I had to question myself that, why did that happen? That's because I did not do my research. I did not know that in order for you to go to a stall to sell, you need to find out who the audience are going to be. Who are the people that are going to be there? Most of the people that were going to there were new moms. So the people around me were selling. But to cut a long story short, I needed that kick in order for me to understand that my business can actually be global. So, um, yeah, so that is me. So what I would like you to take away today is that it's your responsibility to find out what your purpose is. Nobody's going to do that for you. And your purpose is going to be the reason, as I said, the reason why you're here on planet Earth. Is that thing that will keep you going. You know, where every other thing is falling apart, your purpose is what will, give you, will keep you going. And um, that is it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. <laughs>